Welcome to the Outer Limits of Inner Truth Radio Show. OuterLimitsRadio.com. I'm your host, Ryan. Tonight, we have an amazing guest, a medical intuitive, who's also a serial entrepreneur. But before we begin tonight's program, I need to bring something to your attention that is uh, probably some, it's, it's sad news. Facebook today purged 600 pages, just deleted them without warning, and so did Twitter. Most of the pages were anti-war, were pro-peace, were pro-liberty, which is completely gone. No warning. They're saying, oh, I violated some of the guidelines. 1984 is here. Anytime you have corporate censorship, corporate censorship is government censorship. So the evil forces behind the Iron Curtain are trying to prevent you, don't want you to know what's really going on. They're trying to protect a secret or a number of secrets. Who knows what they're trying to do? But any form of censorship in any capacity, I find completely revulsive. And when it comes to the truth, I encourage you to continue to seek it in all different places. Your intuition, what's in your heart, cannot be censored. Your instability, for curiosity, for seeking wisdom, for seeking the truth, that cannot be censored. So when you see barriers like this, when you see the government and corporations working hand in hand to prevent you from attaining information, that's when you should be seeking it hardest with the most intensity. Let us begin tonight's program. Joining us now is Julie Ryan. She is a medical intuitive. She can sense what medical conditions and illnesses a person has. She's probably picking up the fact that my liver is way overworked because I've discovered some new IPAs. She's going to translate some messages. And she can also facilitate energy healings. She can see energy fields. You can learn more about Miss Julie Ryan by going to her website at AskJulieRyan.com. Miss Ryan, welcome to our program. So great to have you. Thanks, Ryan. I'm delighted to be here. And by the way, I don't know what shape your liver's in because I'll have my radar turned on. Okay. I turn it on. And, yeah. You have to. So you, you you plug in a radar. Is it plug into a USB? How does it work? No, nope, it's all in my brain. <laughs> okay. I don't want to know about. Wherever my brain is, I can do it. So it's really convenient. <laughs> okay, you know, what? I'm wondering just off the top because I imagine I'm probably not the only person who drinks some beers. But are you giving your liver a healthy workout by giving it some alcohol once in a while, just to say, hey, you know, you're not doing it all the time. You just want to keep it in shape the same way you run in order to keep your body in shape. Well, if that's what you want to believe, then that's just perfect. What? Is that what I want to believe? It's what What about your experience with that firsthand observing? Uh, I, it, it's uh, If I'm working with somebody who is an alcoholic, certainly their liver looks like it's a mess. And I think the body can tolerate it, some of it. It just, everybody's different. It just depends on what your gut biome's doing and what the makeup is. And, uh, you know, there are about a bazillion factors that come into play. Okay. So, you're a businesswoman also, an inventor, an author, and a serial entrepreneur. So, between all of those, you became a medical intuitive. How did you become a medical intuitive? And also, what exactly is a medical intuitive? Great question. A medical intuitive is someone who uses energy to help diagnose and facilitate healing with medical conditions. And I am, a, a, as you mentioned, an inventor. I've invented surgical devices, orthopedic surgery devices, Ryan, that are sold throughout the world and have been for close to 30 years now. And I have started uh, nine companies in five different industries over the last 35 years. That's amazing. And and I was in, always had my fingers in the medical business on the supply side of the equation. And someone gave me a book. Oh, I guess I was in my mid-30s, and I read it, and it was about a medical intuitive, and I'd never heard that name or that term before, and I thought, what the heck is this? And so I read it, and I was interested, and 
that was back in the day before we had Amazon or really even the internet, much of the internet. So Ryan, I went to a bookstore. Whoa. <laughs> like, Oh, yeah. Yep. And I, um, just to give everyone a heads up, especially you millennials out there, that means going outside. You walk outside your house and you see the 3D graphics outside. You're not using your phone. So, sorry. Please continue. That's right. So, <laughs> I found a book about uh, energetic healing that was written by a former NASA physicist. And that didn't pick my interest and I read that and after reading that I I called her school which her name was Bar is Barbara Brennan she's still alive and I called her school and said do you have anybody I was living in Nashville at the time and I said do you have anybody in Nashville that's a graduate and or is teaching your curriculum and sure enough they did and so I met a woman there and uh, started studying with her and took formalized classes for six years Ryan and still she's still a dear friend and mentor and teacher for me, and uh, I don't do classes anymore, but over the past 25 years, I've taken the knowledge that I learned about quantum physics and energy and uh, come up with my own methodologies methodologies and uh, techniques, and, and I work with people all over the world now. It's really amazing, and before we go into a little bit more about your ability of being a medical intuitive, what you've done, starting this many companies in such a short period of time, what do you think has been the secret to your success? Do you meditate? How are you able to facilitate so much consciousness through your body and being able to manifest incredible things, and again, in a short number of uh, time on Earth? I didn't, at that point, I wasn't doing meditating or anything like that. I, I did exercise, but... I wasn't doing anything out of the norm. I think it's a, a DNA thing, really. I think entrepreneurs are are half our, our nature and half are nurtured. I certainly didn't grow up in a home with an entrepreneur, but I think I have a just a natural level, a high level of curiosity. And when I would find something that was interesting – I would explore it, and after I started my first company at 25, I had enough money to take some of that and start other companies, but they weren't in the same field necessarily. So I just looked for opportunities, usually before they would arise, and then uh, try to capitalize capitalize on those. Okay. Now, did your sensitivity, two things, how did it progress, and was there anything that you had done that accelerated the progression of your sensitivity. My psychic ability, you're talking about. Yeah, you, the, your, your your psychic ability, your sensitivity to perceiving information, your sensitivity to becoming inspired, your sensitivity or the ability to manifest. I guess it's a, it's kind of open. It's like what have what what things were you doing in your life that were allowing more energy to come in that were allowing you to become more sensitive, that were allowing you to all of a sudden do things in your life in that present moment that you had not been able to do in your life previously? Well, I think as an entrepreneur, once, and you know this, you're an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. once you take that initial step and move through the fear, I always focus on what the end result is, and I trust that the people I need to show up are going to show up when I need to meet them to show up, basically. And that's happened in every area of my life, business and personal. And it's it got to the point, I would say, probably even by the time I was 30, that it had happened so often that I just expected. I started expecting it, and I still expect to this day. I just trust that whoever's going to show up is going to be who I need to talk to. And I've learned throughout the, the past 30 years to lessen my control of things and stay focused on what the outcome is that I want. And then that's when the magic happens. And the like all of the variables come into play and, and I get what I want. That's awesome. Is there – have there been two or three particular books that you read that you connected with on a deep level 
that open or change your perception? Yes. Um, uh, the Barbara Brennan book, Hands of Light, for the medical intuitive stuff, that absolutely was really a pivotal book for me. The other one in business that I read was um, The World is Flat. Right. And, um, and by Thomas Friedman. And that really opened my eyes because what I did was I then emulated some of the really big companies as far as outsourcing. So my manufacturing uh, for one of my companies was outsourced to a great big, huge, global, multi-billion dollar company. Uh, My customer service was outsourced to a firm in Manila. My accounting was outsourced. And I had it set up that where when somebody would order a product, they would either do it online or on the phone. The, the call would be received in Manila. Manila would send an email to the manufacturing plant, which was in Mississippi. They would ship the product. They would ship a, they would then email a shipping log back to Manila. Manila would notify the customers and, um, and it worked like a charm. And also my uh, accounting firm would get notified via email as well. And so the invoices normally went out in some instances before the product was even shipped. So when I sold that company, Ryan, (laughs) the (laughs) buyers and the venture capital guys and people that were looking at buying it, they were saying, we've never seen this before. How did you come up with this? I don't know. I just came up with it. And it came from, from really the information that I gleaned from the world is flat that Delta used offshore customer service and, you know, all these big, huge companies outsource a lot of their manufacturing and their other different business areas. And I thought, what the heck? If they can do it, I can do it. Awesome. And it worked great. Now, yeah. There are a lot of people who are entrepreneurs, small business owners. Mm-hmm. What is the difference between mm-hmm. somebody who is successful and somebody who is exceptionally successful? Your oh, I think I think that's an individual call. So success to some people is being able to have your own deal and be your own boss and do all of that. It's success to somebody else is a dollar figure. I think it just it's very individualized depending on the individual person. Got it. And one of the things I love reading about your bio is that you say that I'm not one of those psychics who's been talking to people. Dead people since your childhood, and I guess you learned the basis of doing energy work. So I learned how to do all this psychic stuff and energy work. Yeah. How did you How did you do it? And is there can people emulate your same steps and achieve the same result? Oh, I I think we're all psychic. We're all intuitive, Ryan. We've all had situations in our lives where we think of somebody and we receive a phone call from them or we run into them seemingly out of the blue, but that's not out of the blue. We're, we're, we're telepathically communicating with others all the time. You know, when you meet somebody, sometimes you have a really good vibe from them. Sometimes you're like, well, I don't know that I really want to be around this person. And um, that's all psychic ability. We all have the ability. It's just learning to enhance it. Okay. And with advanced psychic perception, do you get visuals? Do you hear things? Does your sense of feeling pick up dramatically? Or are the answers a lot more crystal clear, as if you were hearing a voice within? All of the above. Okay. All the above. I'm a visual learner. So most of my information initially will come in visually, and then I'll have uh, telepathic communication where I call it, I laugh when I call it divine downloads at times, where it's known as direct knowing. Uh, I hear, I can hear auditory things. Um, that It's more telepathic communication. I think people think they're going to hear something, and that's not very common. Uh, I'll hear something like if I'm somewhere and I don't have my radar turned on and, and I'll, I'll hear something and then I'll turn my radar on and then I'll be able to see what's going on. That's how that works. I do interpret kinesthetically as well. If I get a thought on something and it leads me to a statement or some kind of a question, oftentimes I'll feel vibration like goosebumps. With that, and that that I've learned through the past 25 years of doing this is just validation that I'm on the right track. 
Excellent. Well, in addition to being a serial entrepreneur, writing books, you have some other skills. And the skills are you'll be able to scan animals, access people's past lives, remove ghosts from homes and other buildings. And you can also tell how close someone to, how someone how close someone is to death. That's awesome. I have to say that you're probably one of the most skilled and interesting people we've had on the show. So congratulations, that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> I guess I have to ask you. Um, you know, if I'm if I'm am I close to death? I'm just curious. And if if it is, yes, if no, it's okay. I'm just curious. I, I guess that you, well, if you can tell if someone's close to death, I figured, hey, why not? Just be curious. Yeah, yeah, it can. Well, well. I'm sorry. Uh, but I, I'm just I just, yeah, no, I just put my right. I turn my radar on. It takes me a nanosecond, oh. and I, you know, I laugh for your your point you just made. I say I'm a businesswoman that does woo woo, and I'm a buffet of psychicness uh. <laughs> because. <laughs> You know, I do it's all awesome. That stuff. It's awesome that you're incorporating both into it because I don't know what you think, but I feel that all information is consciousness. All I mean, they're like, so well, there's a battle oh, between science like, and mysticism. I like, know that we're all conscious. Like, how is science and mysticism not part of a, another way of explaining the, the totality of something? I don't understand. Oh, you're absolutely right on that. And as an example of that, obviously being an inventor of surgical devices, I was in and out of the operating room for decades. <laughs> all across the country, and oftentimes when I watch healings in my mind's eye happen, they will emulate actual surgeries that I've seen performed in the operating room. I can tell, I can name the instruments. Yes. I can tell you what devices they're using. I can read the anesthesia equipment when somebody's in surgery real time. Um, and oftentimes I will not only watch that, but then I'll see a procedure or a device or an instrument be used that I don't think has been invented yet. Wow. And um, I watch stem cell energy get utilized to generate new body parts, um, tissue, bone, brain matter, whatever. I watch uh, DNA get recoded with cancer patients and other patients that have a genetic situation going on. It's called genome editing, where the mutation in the DNA gets corrected. I watch strands of DNA come out of the chromosomes, and I watch them get refigured. And that's really fascinating. And it's hilarious, Brian, when that when it, it changes scans or blood tests or something, and the doctor are going, what the heck? And the, and the patient's going, yeah, I get this woman I'm working with. She does voodoo medicine. And the doctor's like, okay, good. Tell her to continue. But uh, I have, it's wonderful. Yeah, I have doctors send patients to me from all over the world when they can't figure out a diagnosis. Okay. And I can um, – I can help them with that. Oftentimes I'm on conference calls with teams of medical professionals um, that are caring for an individual patient. And I'll be able to tell whether the methodologies and the, you know, the physical therapy or whatever that's going on, if it's generating new new nerve patterns or, or healing the muscle or whatever. So I'm kind of like a secret agent in some ways with doctors. <laughs> but but I but the important thing is I don't scan anybody without their permission. So I don't leave my radar turned on, right? And I, I just think that's unethical. And so if I if somebody says, Can you scan my child, I'm gonna ask that child for permission telepathically and if I get a no, I won't do it. Because I just don't think it's right. Well Thank you. And NSA, who's monitoring every phone call, maybe you should take a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Follow the so, Julie Ryan example there. <laughs> but, but to your question a couple minutes ago, of, yeah. are you dying? I'm going to get you on my radar. No, you're not dying. Your spirit is in your body. It's attached yeah, to your yeah, body. Because yeah. yeah. my, my wife's like, you, you're not allowed to die until markets is paid off. I'm like, all right. I'm, so I, just, I made a promise to her. So. Good. Hilarious. Yeah, Hilarious. no, I gotta tell him. I gotta tell him. Listen, wait, BB. I like my May I mention it. how I know that? How I know you're not dying? Um, Can I sure. go into that for a second? Yeah, absolutely, okay. sure. That's wonderful. Oh. Okay, most of us have heard or been taught through religion or through, you know, some kind of new age thing, or we've read whatever that the spirit is in a body having a human experience. Okay. What I perceive, Ryan, is that the body's in the spirit having a human experience. Because if you look at a a painting or a picture of, for instance, a religious figure, 
oftentimes they'll be depicted with a halo around their head or around their whole body. That's their energy field. It's their spirit. It's their soul. It's all the same thing. If you look at a picture or a photograph of somebody and it shows their aura, same thing. So guess what? We're all holy. We're, you know, we're all, we all have spirits. We all have energy fields. And, and that's what that is that's depicted. The spirit is the energy power source for the body, which is why when somebody dies, their spirit leaves their body and their body doesn't work anymore. And so when somebody's dying, the spirit evacuates from the body. It's all holographic through the top of the head. And it looks like a bubble, like in a cartoon, you know, the caption where the words are. And and then there are other different things that happen. Deceased loved ones, spirits are present. There are angels that are present when somebody's dying. And they go into different configurations. I call that the 12 phases of transition. And that's in my book, Angelic Attendance. And so you have none of that going on. So I know you're just very blocked. Um, we're very yeah. thankful. Also, yeah, and by the way, angelic attendance, what really happens as we transition from this life into the next, if you look on Amazon, it's got 46 five-star customer reviews. So just getting to that right now. So if you person is going to die, I mean, you know, sometimes people die suddenly, which I think is absolute worst. If mm-hmm. you, you're talking to someone and they're like, hey, you know, I'm doing okay, and you sense and you see these angels around and you say, hey, you know, hey, by the way, you know, you got this around you. Is it, do you, do you pick that up? I, mean, do I absolutely do. Okay. I absolutely do. And I don't edit anything that I get. Again, it's an ethical thing. I believe if I'm getting the information, who am I to decide whether or not that person needs to hear it? I believe I'm the conduit. I'm the communication device. And yes, I don't edit anything that I get. Oh, that's really wonderful. And, but, but along those lines, if somebody's dying, what I do is I'll refer them to my website, AskJulieRyan.com. And on that website, Ryan, is a graphic of the 12 phases of transition, which shows how angels are positioned, how deceased loved ones are positioned, how spirits of, of deceased pets are even there. And so it adds a glorious component to something that's really frightening for all of us. And I find in working with families over the past 25 years that it's not so much we're afraid of what's going to happen when we die. We're afraid of what's going to happen as we're dying. You know, wow. that's, the, that's the scary part. I, I'm one of the few people I know that, that kind of is excited about going to hell because it's going to be awesome because all the cool people are there. If you listen to Billy Joel's song, <laughs> yeah. I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. I'm like, Billy Joel has it. That's why I make well, it a point every day to sin. I, well, here, I got a news flash for you. Yes. Here's the news flash. All right, you ready? Yes. Everybody goes to heaven. Oh! Like all dogs go to heaven. Really? All people go to heaven, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? Everybody, everybody's carried off by angels. Everybody goes to heaven. Hell is hell and fire and damnation and all that stuff was created to control the masses by, by governments and religions and all of that. It doesn't exist. Mean, exist. Are you telling me that the person that we're likely having political discussions with and we disagree with and we have arguments with, they're going to the same place we're going? We have to go spend eternity with that person? Well, the part that you're missing in that is all of that drama and everything, all the personality stuff stays with the body when okay. the body dies. All right, good. Every spirit is pure love and light and pure, pure essence, pure energy. If you're divine. That's um. All right. Well, that's comforting. So good. So we leave this here. One of the things <laughs> I was <laughs> thinking about is when you were getting these knowings about medical procedures. I was thinking yeah. about Edgar Casey. I was thinking about a gentleman named Lou Smith. We interviewed his son on the show, and he was doing all kinds of innovations. And were you getting this information? Did you feel? from source, from uh, the Akashic records of human consciousness, all past, present, and future? Or did you ever get the feeling that you were getting this information from other civilizations that were in a much more evolved state that were translating their techniques and their frequencies to you? All of the above. Okay. All of the above. I believe that there hasn't ever been an original idea 
in the history of mankind. I believe that all ideas are floating around in the ethers, and when we become a vibrational match to that, then those ideas come to us. And so when I'm scanning somebody medically, for instance, I I close my eyes and I watch a laser beam come from my body and it hooks into them wherever they are anywhere in the world. And then I shoot energy into them and it says, if I'm looking at a hologram of them, Ryan, kind of like beam me up, Scotty, from the Star Trek days, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, I, and then I watch the energy go to wherever it's most needed first and it will show up as, Something's broken, something's inflamed, something's whatever. And then immediately thereafter, I will watch an energetic healing occur. Something can get sucked up. Something can be added. I watch, like I mentioned before, energetic surgical procedures happen all the time. Uh, and I describe to my client what I'm watching. And uh, and then I, I will get information when I'm plugged into them. It's called a bioplasmic streamer that I use to connect in with them. And I'll get information that will come into my head. For instance, I was talking with a family one time with a, a, um, a mom and a dad of a I don't know, first grader or something, little girl. And she kept coming home with headlights. And they said, we can't use this shampoo on her repeatedly because it's too toxic. And they said, you can only use it once or twice. And they, they said, every time we send her back to school, she's getting reinfected by some other kid who, you know, they keep reinfecting each other. So what I got in my mind, in my head was rinse her hair with apple cider vinegar. I thought, well, okay. I never heard of that, but what the heck? So we Googled it, Ryan. Sure enough, there's <laughs> pages online of that. I got, I, I was scanning a cat recently. The cat had a viral infection. The, mo- the, the mom, the owner, didn't know what to do with the cat. And I got feed it cooked chicken and rice. Well, I've never owned a cat. I never heard of that. Again, we Googled it, and there was tons of information on there, lots and lots of posts about, you know, this is the best thing to feed your cat when your cat's stomach stomach is upset. So so that's how information comes to me. Once I'm plugged into somebody, I see it visually. It's coming in direct knowing, telepathically. It's coming in kinesthetically, and I just combine all of them and don't even think about it because I just have done it for so long. And when you were dealing with something in your own life, a personal trial or tribulation, does mm-hmm. that impact the variance of your vibration? Does that impact the ability to present the information crystal clear? Or do you find that sometimes you will have a moral bias to some degree based on the person that you are particularly reading? Great question. When I was being trained, and again, I went through six years of formal training. It cost me four times the amount of money to put myself through that training than it did to put myself through four years of bachelor's degree in college, by the way. Um, I had pounded, pounded, pounded into me how to be sure that I'm not do- involved in what's called transference, which is putting my stuff on somebody else, my personal biases, my personal whatever. And so... I, what what I do is I consider myself kind of like a jet flying across the country where it's always self-correcting. You know, the computers on board are always self-correcting. We think jets fly in a straight line. They don't. They're kind of going on zigzag. Well, I'm talking about a jet. We always have turbulence. People, I'm one of those people, everyone falls asleep in a plane except for me. I'm always, like, freaking out. Yeah. So I'm always checking and it's become second nature to me now to be sure that I'm getting the right information. So, for instance, if somebody says to me, should I go have chemo or should I should I um, avoid chemo? I've just been diagnosed with cancer, whatever. And how I've learned to come up with responses to those really tough life questions, Ryan, and again, I'm all about the ethical thing. You know, what's going to be in this person's best interest? What I've come up with is that we all can do this and we can get divine guidance by asking a question in our head or aloud and we say, is it in my best interest too? And finish the sentence. The first thing that pops into your head within a second is going to be divine guidance from God, the universe, your spirit guides, your deceased loved ones, the angels, I mean the whole group. If you take longer than a second to think about it, that's your brain that's going to answering you. 
And the other thing to remember is that spirits are very literal. So the more concise we can be in the questions that we ask, the better information we're going to get. For example, if you ask a question like, uh, is, is it in my best interest to go to the concert on Thursday night? Seems like a good question. And you go to the concert and something happens, you know, and it's a nightmare. And you're coming home going, hey, what's up with that? But if you ask, is it in my best interest to go to the concert on Thursday night at the ABC arena to see XYZ band? See how concise that is? Yes. You're going to get, you're going to get information that's going to be more usable. Okay. Okay. Because spirits are always going to give you correct information, but it depends on how you ask the question. So if it's something that's life threatening or something that's really an, you need a, you know, an on the spot decision, preface it with, at this moment in time, is it in my best interest too? Right. I want to pause you there for one second because it is that you're talking about, you know, getting the right message. Make sure you get the mm-hmm. intuitive right message. But I'm wondering, what is the difference between getting divine guidance, spiritual guidance, and acting on an impulse of your body? I'll give an example. It's 2 o'clock in the morning I wake up, and I go, should I have a bag of Doritos? Now, I know <laughs> on a metaphysical level, no, don't eat the bag of Doritos. Go back to bed and continue dreaming of sheep. However, my body's like, no, the Doritos are very nutritious. And the gut feeling is pulling me towards the Doritos. So, like, I know it's my body telling me this, but it's very hard because my body puts up a very strong, convincing argument. And I'm bringing this to your attention because I'm wondering how often and how easy can we be deceived by what we are doing based on our impulses of our body which should be very strong just like you know you go through a drug withdrawal you have these incredible impulses and knowing the difference between an impulse and knowing what your divine guidance is saying well I, that that is is just makes me think of you know an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other like we're little we're like your angel's going no 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 don't do it like, oh yeah baby go do it um, I think I think that's a great point, Ryan. I think that we do have um, physiological impulses and cravings, most of them originating in our guts, based on what's happening with our gut biome. And um, and I think that that the is it in my best interest to is a really good tool to use to be able to discern whether or not it really is in my best interest, or is it just my body's craving sugar or, or booze or whatever. And and it works really well to do that. You can also do it with other people and with animals and with whatever. You can you can ask is it in my you can ask multiple choice questions. Is it in my best interest to eat carrot cake or chocolate cake? I mean, <laughs> I, I tell people practice with it. The more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. And practice with it with stuff that doesn't matter. I use it when I'm driving. Is it in my best interest to take the freeway or to take surface streets if I'm running late or something like that? It always comes in. It's always it's always right there. Uh, so did you eat the Doritos? Yes, yes, I did. I ate the Doritos. I I, oh, I, okay. I, I, I did eat the Doritos and I woke up. And I was like, oh, I, I was like, you know, having a discussion. I, was like, I can't believe it. Like, why did I eat the Doritos? I, I don't know. I don't know what it was. I sometimes I don't. I that's why I brought it up because it's a back and forth. It's a little bit of a battle. <laughs> But I regret yeah. eating Doritos, so in place of the Doritos, I have, uh, you know, I'm going to drink some seltzer instead. But um, what are the other services that you provide, which I thought really interesting, well, is yeah. scanning a house, checking a paranormal. Because when I moved into a house, if I go anywhere and I get a creepy feeling that there's a ghost there, I walk right out. I don't want anything to do with that. I don't want any spirits following me. How is mm-hmm. that like for you? How do you actually go through clearing and... Have you ever had an experience where the negativity was so strong within a house that you felt it was not worth your time and effort to engage that, knowing that you could be hurt permanently because of the intensity of the evil that you were dealing with? No, because all spirits are are love and light. I think that evil spirit thing has been concocted to, again, control the masses, sell books, do movies, <laughs> stuff like that. I don't, I, it doesn't exist. 
as far as I'm concerned, I, you know, I don't believe it. It, it, I've never encountered it in 25 years. What I do when I scan homes, I'm usually scanning homes because somebody is buying a house and they want me to scan the home so they can give a list to their inspector. (laughs) And the inspector, (laughs) look at the list going, okay, how do you know there's mold and eave in the upper left corner, you know, of a 30 foot tall ceiling and whatever. Um, so I do that a lot, but uh, but as far as ghosts and stuff, actually, there's a whole chapter in my book about this train wreck that I saw in an office building. It was wild, Ryan, and it oh. had, you know, it, it it had ghosts opening doors and coming in, and it it was just wild. And uh, and so in some cases, if there's a lot of paranormal activity, what I'll do is I will get them to go into the light. Usually ghosts don't know that they're dead. They're just spirits that are living a concurrent existence in the spirit world and also, you know, in this plane. Just But they look like holograms of what they looked like at the time that they lived. It's pretty interesting because I'll see them in period dress oftentimes. And, and there have been situations where there have been, for instance, there's a, a woman whose house I scanned and she, she was having stuff happen like, like she had uh, cooking utensils on the wall, the antique cooking utensils in her kitchen, and she and her daughters were fixing Thanksgiving dinner one time, and they watched these utensils come off the wall and go and land on the countertop. I would be oh, out of that house so fast. <laughs> I wouldn't even make the first commercial break of all. It's a hot thing. The opening grants make it up. No, problem solved. Yeah. Oh, so so they said to me, they called me and they go, what the heck was that? And so what I what I got was there was a, a man who who used to live there and it had been a farm at one point that where their housing development is now was a farm. And the woman that owned the house said, yeah, we found all these antique like farm tools and stuff in the garden, you know, buried in the dirt. And and it was um, a house in this deep south. And it, it was, I saw this man's son come in a Confederate uniform and he was looking for his daughter. And so I was able to bring in the daughter's spirit to reunite with the man that was looking for the daughter and the grandfather that was looking for the daughter. And then they went into the light together and there haven't been any more paranormal events in that home. So normally when that happens, it's, it's somebody just that hasn't, they don't feel like they've finished their experience in that lifetime. And so it's a, it's a concurrent reality. Does that make sense? That I'll see, but it's, but it's really interesting because in that case with the Confederate soldier, what I did was I got the person's name who, with the farmer, you know, during the civil war period, they were able to go back and find the original deed to the land with the guy's name on it. So, I, and, and it's really fun with past life experiences, too, because oftentimes I'll get a name or I'll get information like, here's the year. I'll always get a year and where it was and where the person lived and a little bit about what happened at that time, and then we'll correlate it with their current lifetime. But it's fascinating because I was doing a consult with somebody last week, and it was a woman and she had been a man living in Holland, I think it was. And there were there was this army, some men that were in an army, and this is from the 1700s, early 1700s, that came through her property and caused problems. And um, and so I got the year, and I got where it was. And so we checked it online, and sure enough, there was a war going on that <laughs> these military people were crossing through exactly where we got where the location was and i promise you i have no um i have no background in dutch history <laughs> i don't know i mean i don't know any of this i can't tell you about wars that were fought over there amazing that you're able so, to pick things up yeah it's really fun well, really fun when it comes to guides i had a very i would I like to think sometimes I tell people this is a strange experience, but it's not strange, strange to me because all these things happen. And I just accept them for what they are. But Julie, I had a kind of a strange experience where a very close friend of mine, it turns out that we both had a similar guide 
actually the same God, and it's strange. And I'm wondering, from your perspective, are there certain individuals at your level of understanding, at your level of commitment to the work that you're doing, do you have similar guides? Do you share similar guides to people who are at a very high level of success? And if so, who are some of those guides? Oh, boy. I've never thought of that before. Let me think about that for a second. My main guide is a, um, a deceased pope named Clement the Sixth. He's my main spirit guide. Most of us have Usually, I normally, if I'm scanning somebody and they want to do, they want to talk to their spirit guides. Normally, there are seven that will show up, Brian, and they stand behind the person in a kind of a horseshoe position. And it's so funny because they all appear initially as versions of Father Time, like Dumbledore in the Harry Potter movies or Gandalf in the Lord of the Rings movies. And some of them are tall and thin, some of them are short and fat, some of them are just regular. And they all show up as men, just and they're all wearing white gowns, long white hair, long white beards. That's just so I can identify that they're spirit guides. That's how they show up to me. And then when we pinpoint on individual ones, then they morph into what they look like in a lifetime that they live that correlates with what they're advising the person about in this current lifetime. So Clement the Sixth showed up in my life probably about 10 years ago. And he showed up when I was with my mentor and she was doing a healing on me and my deceased loved ones spirits are in the room and, and a couple of other guides and in the the left corner near my left foot, I'm laying face up on this massage table, this Pope and the old Pope outfit shows up. And I said, "Uh, can I help you? And and I said, who are you? And he said, "Uh, I'm Clement. And I said, there was a Pope Clement. And he said, yeah, I was number six. And he laughed about it. And I said, well, can I help you? And he said, yeah. He said, part of your goal, part of your mission in life this time around is to educate the world about what happens when people die. Because people are so afraid and there's no reason for them to be afraid. And so I said, no, you don't understand. I'm a businesswoman. I'm not putting myself out there. (laughs) And and I'm thinking, afterwards, I'm thinking, I'm arguing with the dead Pope, for God's sakes. So... He just laughed, and he goes, yeah, yeah, well, you know, you will, and and I'm going to help you with it. And so long story short, I go in my car to go home, and I just for kicks, I Googled Pope Clement the Sixth. Ryan, he was in office during the bubonic plague oh, wow. where 60-some percent, I think it's like 68 percent of Europe died, and he's best known for his prayers for the dying and his prayers for the dead. And I thought, okay, Ryan, you can't make this stuff off. Well, hey, <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty high profile yeah. guide. Yeah. So um, I don't know if I share guides with other psychics. I've never looked into it. I've never had any interest in looking into it. So. Okay. When, um, as a medical intuitive, I'm curious. Right now, we live in a culture where a lot of people have cell phones. We have Wi-Fi going all over the place. I I imagine that's probably having a negative consequence in our bodies. And I wonder, do you ever pick up any messages or um, insight at the long-term negative health effects of cell phones? And is there anything that we can be doing to strengthening our body to minimize the damage caused by all this excessive radiation that's floating around in the air? Yeah, again, another great question. Absolutely. I ground myself every night. There's a device that goes in my bed between the bottom sheet and the top sheet, and so I ground myself for eight hours or however long I sleep, you know, whatever, um, every night. I can really feel it when I fly because basically we're in a metal tube being pinged by radar for hours on end. And when I put this device into my bed in my hotel, I can feel tingles on my body for about less than a minute, but I know I'm being grounded. Um, I think cell phones, just avoid holding it next to your head. Have it on speakerphone, have earbuds. I think all this glioblastoma that we're seeing with the brain cancer, I absolutely think there's a correlation with that and with the cell phones. 
If you look online, there are uh, uh, thermography images you can see about how the heat is going into the head and the face. You know, it looks like an, it's colored and you can see where the red is as far as the, the way, you know, the um, EMF going into the skull. Um, yeah, I think there's very definitely that. I've, I've read that some people, what they'll do is they'll turn their phone on airplane mode at night or not even have it in their bedroom. Some people have gone to putting their Wi-Fi, a switch on their Wi-Fi where they can turn it off at night when they go to bed. Some people go so far as to turn off all the electricity in their bedroom when they're sleeping. I think that there's there's definitely a happy medium, but I I do believe that there is something that we're going to need to. But we're there's there are enough people raising enough questions that I think the science is starting to really evaluate seriously what's happening and not just listen to the you know the cell phone industry that oh, is like, oh, there's no problem with it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think there definitely is something to that. Got it. You know, one of your skills is PET scanning, and I've always yeah. wanted to know, is there anything that we can do to prolong the life of our pets while minimizing the life expectancy of our in-laws? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no and no. That's a serious question. <laughs> well, I, think, I, think, I think with our pets, again, as with humans, it's, it's if we can do what we can to keep them healthy and give them exercise and lots of love and things like that. And uh, with in-laws, I think same thing. <laughs> you know, if 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 you have heartburn when your in-laws come to visit, what I've learned at this stage in my life, Ryan, is anything that feels bad to me, like I, it makes me frustrated or mad or sad or whatever, it's just a red flag to me to look at it from a different perspective. So I think everybody has redeeming qualities. And so when the in-laws come to visit and they're just on your last nerve, just switch how you're looking at it to, well, maybe this person's really lonely or maybe this person had a really rough life and you know, there are a bazillion different things you can do, but I think it's it's a, an opportunity to pivot. And then that's going to make you feel better, and it's going to raise your vibrational level, which is going to make you feel better, too. Miss Julie Ryan, I want to thank you so much for an engaging interview. It's so much fun. I think you have a lot of profound, wonderful insights. Julie's book is called What Really Happens as We Transition Transition from This Life to the Next. And it's called Angelic Attendance. You can learn more about Ms. Julie Ryan by going to her website at askjulieryan.com. Ms. Ryan, it was a true pleasure and honor to have you with us. Thank you so much. My pleasure. May I say one quick last thing? Absolutely. Okay, that is I do a show every Thursday night, a podcast, Ryan, with a with it that's taped with a live audience. And people call in from all over the world, and they ask Julie Ryan. They ask me a question about anything that we've just talked about, and I answer them. Last night I did my show, and I think I got 12 callers on and 12 questions answered. That's so fantastic. it's really fun, and it's free. Yeah. And, um, again, AskJulieRyan.com. Click on podcast, and I see what are the ones that you have. Diet soda and back pain, migraine relief, surviving grief. I mean, you, you cover a lot of interesting topics. And I love the fact that you customize graphics on each one. So, obviously, you're putting a lot of time and effort and love into that. So, that's wonderful. Well, and that's just one question that's been asked. There are, there are a multitude of callers with a multitude of different questions asked on every show. Excellent. Well, Ms. Ryan, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Okay, everyone, that concludes today's edition of the Out of Limits of In Truth Radio Show. Special thanks to our featured guest, Miss Julie Ryan, and special thanks as always to our virtues, Miss Carrie O'Connor, Miss Lisa Caza, and Miss Constance Dallas. To learn more about the Out of Limits of In Truth Radio Show, please go to our website at outoflimitsradio.com. Until the next time we meet, my friends, wishing upon you an abundance of peace, love, and beers. Take good care, and thank you so much for listening. 
Want to be heard or seen in front of millions of people? Want to be an expert on TV or radio? Goldman McCormick PR is a New York City-based public relations agency that specializes in traditional and social media placement for law, finance, media, and corporate-based clients. Goldman McCormick PR also are specialists in website development, radio show creation, press conferences, media training, and so much more. Check out GoldmanMcCormick.com for more information. GoldmanMcCormick.com. 